just said. They're the epicenter of the future. They're where past, present, and future converge. It's it's where Christ will return and where he'll rule the world for a thousand years. And it's high time the American church woke up and realized that the stage is indeed set and that world events are marching headlong towards that. I mean, it could be another 50, another 100,000, 10,000 years, but I kind of doubt it. We could see the opening of the seventh week of Daniel in our life. I was reading, I'm reading Eric Metaxas' book, um, Religionist Christianity, and he's talking about the fact that we almost take end time prophecy as a fable. You know, a lot of Christians believe, you know, Noah and the flood, Jonah and the fish was a fables and, you know, or to just mm -hmm. take it so lightly, it might as well be a fable. And his contention is, is we don't realize where we are today. And uh, from a biblical standpoint, and our churches certainly aren't teaching this at all. And uh, it's almost not being addressed at all. And there's prophecy being fulfilled in Egypt, Syria, Turkey, and Iran right now. I mean, right before our eyes and certainly prophecy being fulfilled in Israel and and, um, there's a lot going on, so, you know, I suggest we pay attention. You know, the 70th week of Daniel is the last seven years of history as we know it. It's the the remaining part of Daniel's prophecy that's yet to be fulfilled. It's the first 69 weeks of years, or 483 years, were fulfilled from the issuing of the decree by our Xerxes under Nehemiah to rebuild the wall to when the Messiah was cut off, it says in Daniel when Christ was crucified. So that prophecy played out exactly, but there's seven years hanging out. The age of the Gentiles, the church age, and the Jewish age, and the world as we know it will all culminate in this last seven years of time. And it's, uh, the, the Olivet Discourse is the decoder ring to all of it. Everything about it is in there. Jesus spoke of the first half of the 70th week. Daniel, he called it the beginning of sorrows. And he went through the first four horsemen of the apocalypse, the first four seals in the scroll of the book of Revelation. Some translations call it the beginning of birth pangs or birth pains, mm. meaning they will intensify and grow. And the, the, the Antichrist coming on the scene, we don't know it's him when it actually occurs, even when he signs the peace treaty with Israel, which don't know till the midpoint, but... The next four horsemen of the apocalypse that Jesus goes through in numerical order are war, pestilence, famine, and death. And so my guess is, is we they're not that's not a real strong sign, but my guess is is that during this the you know, birth pangs, like you know, when 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 a woman's having birth pains, they get more and more and more and more intense until she finally mm -hmm. has a baby. We're about to have a big baby. Seventieth week of Daniel breaks, these things will probably amp up dramatically paying attention to the world stage, these things are teetering on the edge of amping up dramatically. If you remember when Trump was in office, the whole world was calmed down. They even had rocket men calm down. Now we got Iran this close to a nuclear weapon, thanks to Biden. Biden's funding Hamas and Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram, and so is Iran. And we got Middle East and powder keg, got Russia and Ukraine. We've got Russia now threatening Europe. We got Russia now threatening America because of what Biden's doing. And we got China threatening not only Taiwan, but Japan and India. We got rocket man threatening South of Korea. I mean, the, the world's teetering on the edge yeah. of that. And in the last two years, every major CEO of every major food supply company in the world has made a comment along these lines that the food supply chains of the world are, about, are teetering on the edge of collapse. The COVID vaccines led us to, we're running at 40% excess deaths and birth rates are collapsing at the same rate. Elon Musk is all over this. We're witnessing the collapse of civilization if something doesn't change soon. There's six prevalent positions, and each one of them is mutually exclusive from the other, which means they cannot all be right. In fact, at most one could be right, and the rest have to be wrong. And if it's astonishing to me that in our churches, we embrace these six mutually exclusive positions as if they're equally violent. It comes down to the fact that which one I'm right, F one I'm right. But I'm here to tell you with all confidence, and I've taught this for 35 years now, I spent a year of my life deeply immersed in this one subject. Not one of them line up with the Word of God. In fact, wow. not one of them even come close to what Jesus plainly said in the Olivet Discourse, which is the decoder ring to all of eschatology. Mm -hmm. Now, about the time I realized that they were wrong about 35 years ago, uh, a lot of people started realizing the same thing at the same time. And there's a position called pre-wrath rapture that is emerging rapidly. 
I completely agree with that. It's completely in line with what Jesus said. It completely lines up with scripture. You see, in scripture, the order that Jesus went through all the seals, he went through six of the seven seals, and they asked him the simple question, when are you coming back? And what would be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? He went through them in numerical order. The sequence of events is exactly the same in scripture, everywhere you find it, Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Revelation, without exception. And it doesn't match any of these six prevalent positions, but it does match pre-wrath rapture. Joel Richardson, uh, Robert Van Campen, and the signs and like tongues, deep exegetical analysis of this, uh, all these men, along with Travis Snow, and completely congruous with scripture. It's fascinating because the late 1980s, I was in the late 20s, I was like, you know, this is insanity. You know, we can't have six mutually exclusive positions. If I say yeah. this guy's purple and you say it's pink polka dotted, one of us is wrong. And mm -hmm. if the sky's blue, then we're both wrong, right? These mm -hmm. positions cannot all be right. And I'm convinced they're not only false doctrine, they're doctrines of demons. And mm -hmm. it's setting the church up for what Paul calls the great falling away, or eschatologists call it the great apostasy, because churches are going to be deceived. We watch it. We watched it during COVID. I mean, the churches were the worst. They were participating in the spirit of the Antichrist and still to this day have no clue that they were. And so yeah. when the 70th week opens, <laughs> well, there's going to be some yeah. people ripe for deception and the great falling away that Paul warned of grievously. But the most fascinating thing to me is when Jesus asked a simple question, when you come back, what will be the sign of you coming at the end of the age? He answered it in brilliant detail. But I've read the debates amongst the scholars of these six positions, and the most astonishing thing is they don't care what he said. They, they just they got their <laughs> position. They're going to defend their position, and and you know it's it's insanity. But when Jesus finished finished answering the question, he likened to the fig tree. He said, "Now learn the lesson of the fig tree." Now, fig tree in scripture is very often metaphorical for Israel. A fruitful yeah. fig tree is uh, Israel right relationship with God, and unfruitful is not right relationship with God. And a withering and dying one is turned their back on God. But he says, now learn the lesson of the fig tree. When the sap gets up in the limbs, it buds out. You know, summer's near. Right? You know, the season. Next verse, he says, you won't know the day nor the hour. He said, he didn't even know that. That astonishes me. That's that right. means angels don't know, demons don't know, Mayans don't know. The fact the Mayan calendar ended don't mean doodly squat. Nostradamus didn't know. Martians don't know. Planet Nibiru X. Aliens don't know. Nobody knows, right? The day <laughs> nor the hour. But that's a very faint, <laughs> granular, finite period of time. And most Christians in America, it's the only verse they know of eschatology. Well, no, it's the day or time. <laughs> they were the hour. <laughs> it is the excuse to bury your head in the sand and act like we're not supposed to know these things. But 35% of your Bible deals with this. And I keep finding I'm in the camp that believes it's 35% or more. I just found it in Balaam's four oracles. End time prophecies in Balaam's, Balaam's, the, you remember the talking donkey and the angel with the sword's oracles. It's all there. It's everywhere. It's cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. It's everywhere. God warned us to know. In fact, there's seven times more prophecy regarding his second coming than there was his first. And there were 300 prophecies regarding his first coming. But Jesus, once he finished answering the question, he said four times, and this is crucial, when you see these things, Look up you. for your redemption draws die. When you see these things, know that the end is near. This generation shall not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. And lastly, he said, pray that you're counted worthy to escape these things. Now, when I teach this, I've taught it in little groups, small groups, whole big church services. I've asked the question, can somebody name the, these things? In 35 years, nobody's ever named the, these things. Jesus told us exactly what to look for, to know when he's coming back, the season. And nobody knows. After Jesus went through the first four horse of the apocalypse, the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pains, he makes a comment. He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation that's spoken of the prophet Daniel, that to me is the most important verse in all scripture. If he hadn't have said that, we wouldn't have six prevalent positions. We'd have dozens upon dozens. But he affirmed Daniel's prophecy. And we know from Daniel's prophecy that the abomination that causes the desolation occurs in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel, right? Okay. So he's going to desecrate the temple. Now, a lot of things happen in the middle. I find that most Christians don't know any of these things. The most important thing is Michael the archangel is told to stand up. Say, so what the heck does that mean? I think it's like telling the military you need to stand down. So I envision Michael with big wings out over Israel, and he's told to stand up, stands up, folds his wings, and scripture says, now what will happen? will be allowed to happen. He will restrain no longer. And Michael and his angel armies throw Satan permanently out of heaven. 
right now has got full access to the throne room of God. He's the accuser of the brethren 24-7, right? He's thrown to earth. And just like the great hymn, Mighty Fortresses Our God says, he knows his time is short and his doom is sure, right? So he's out to reach as much hell and havoc on planet earth as possible. He's out to take as many Christians and non-Christians to hell with him as possible. Mm -hmm. He's out to just still wreak havoc and persecution against God's elect and Israel, right? And so he empowers personally the person of the Antichrist. The Antichrist desecrates the temple. Now, there's two types of Antichrist in history. Antiochus Epiphanes, right? Slaughtered a pig in the Jewish temple, erected an image of Zeus and told the Jews to worship right. him and led to the Maccabean revolt. It's a terrible time. Thousands of Jews were slaughtered. Well, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives 200 years after that event and said, this is a future event. So come, here comes Titus, the Roman general. Preterist would say, oh, he's the one. Well, Titus, according to the Agada, he took his sword and sliced the curtain temple in two between the inner court and the Holy Holies. Wow. He took two whores into the Holy Holies, rolled out the scroll, which would be the word of God on the altar and had sex with two whores. The thing astonishes me that lightning bolt become a heaven and vapor man hard. while he's doing this. Then his soldiers, by accident, caught the temple on fire. All that tonnage of gold started melting and running down. The soldiers went in the feeding frenzy, right, and turned every stone upon another. That's what Jesus told him right before he got in the Olivet Discourse. See this temple? Not one time stone will be left upon another. So people would say, well, Titus, well, he's clear to the Antichrist. That's already come and gone. Three mm -hmm. problems. He didn't enter a peace treaty with Israel. He did not, like neither did the Spiffings, neither of these men had entered a peace treaty with Israel, neither demanded worship be directed at them, and neither instituted the mark of the beast, which you could not buy nor sell. And so as soon as this event occurs, when the real Antichrist comes on the screen and desecrates the temple, I do not want, know what he's going to do. Jesus says, run, run like heck. He said, don't even go back for your coat. He said, if you're pregnant or have children, good luck, waddle, you know, but run. And God promises to protect those that do know scripture and do run into the wilderness. He said, I protect them for 42 months from the midpoint to the very end. He said, he'd even swallow up the antichrist armies that he sends after the children of God, because he's wroth when the King James with the children of God, right? So those who run are protected. This is the fifth seal. Jesus calls it the great tribulation. This is where you find the martyrs under the altar that be beheaded for the cause of Christ, crying out, O Lord, holy and true, how long that thou not avenge the blood of them that dwell upon the earth? What does God say? He says, hang on a little while longer while more of your brethren are killed. This is a terrible time. Jesus says of it, nothing like it in the history of the world ever happened before it. Nothing will ever happen like it again. In fact, he said, if he didn't cut it short, no flesh would be saved. As I thought properly, no flesh in Jerusalem, no flesh in Israel, no flesh in the Middle East, no flesh in the whole world. I don't know. But he said it's going to be the worst event. Mao, Stalin, Hitler, ISIS, and their heydays is nothing but a warm-up act for how bad the Great Tribulation is going to be, at least in and around Israel. All eschatological prophecies Jerusalem-centric, by the way. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is, how did he cut it short? Well, he cuts it short with the sixth seal, the cosmic disturbance, as eschatologists call it. You and I know it as the moon turns to blood, the sun only gives light, and the stars fall to the earth and heavens. Whoa. <laughs> Sounds pretty serious to me. So is, is the moon literally going to turn to blood? I don't know. I think it's going to look blood red. And is the sun going to burn out? I mean, if it did, the last light make the 93 million mile journey in eight minutes, and then we'd be dark. But Jesus said he's going to rule the world for a thousand years, and he doesn't talk about doing it in an ice age and pitch darkness. So... I suspect the sun's not going to burn out, but it's going to look dim. And are the stars literally going to fall to the earth? Well, the closest star is the sun. It's a medium-sized star. Because you could put 1.2 million Earths inside the sun, as it were. So if it fell to the earth, it swallowed the earth and wouldn't even know. The next closest star is the Alpha Centauri cluster, the Alpha or Proxima Centauri. It's 25 trillion miles from the Earth, a 4.3 light years away. Small star, but it's nine times bigger than the Earth. So if it failed at 25 trillion miles, the Earth would swallow the Earth and probably belch, and that'd be about it. So the question is, what was John talking about? The obvious answer is meteors, shooting stars. A meteor is a fragment of an asteroid. An asteroid is a massive space rock. And they're, 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 when they hit the Earth, they do tremendous damage. 
Now, about eight, 10 years ago, God told me to put all my teachings together on this subject into one document. It fell together like a hand in a glove. It's about 300 pages, formatted, color, table of contents, appendix, many, many, many sections. But anyway, while I'm doing that, I ran across a plot by Visual Capitalist. I love those guys. They plot things in very compelling ways. And in the Visual Capitalist, in this plot, they took all the objects in our solar system using NASA's data and plotted them. Now, I'm a math kind of science guy, and as a young man, I was one time very interested in astronomy, and I never, ever, ever knew this. Between Mars, our next door neighbor going away from the sun, and the sun's clear as a bell. You've got the occasional asteroid or occasional comet flying through, and that's about it. But beyond Mars orbits, what's known as an asteroid band in width is twice the distance, two and a half times the distance between Earth and Mars. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way around the sun, so in our elliptical plane, and beyond it's clear as a bell again. Jupiter's the vacuum cleaner for our solar system. It made the SETI top five or top 10 for life to be possible on planet Earth. This magnificent gravitational pull sucks up everything. What in the heck is that asteroid band doing there? It's densely packed with big asteroids, little asteroids, medium asteroids. It goes all the way around the sun. Speculation. What if God or gravity pulled that asteroid band into our orbit and we're flying all the way around the sun through it and we're rotating as we do, so we bombard it on every side? Hold that thought. If you go into the book of Revelation, look under the sixth seal, this is where you find men hiding under rocks and in caves, begging the mountains to follow them for fear, it says. It says men's hearts are failing them for fear because the mountains and oceans are moving out of the place and the stars are falling to the earth and the heavens. What? <laughs> so, if the mountains and oceans move another place, we're going to have tidal waves, tsunamis, we're going to have earthquakes, but we're also going to have massive tectonic plate movement. Fifteen years ago, a huge volcano in Italy erupted. This an explosive volcano blew a massive ash cloud up in the atmosphere. That ash cloud came over North America and darkened our skies for three days. If you didn't know it was ash cloud, you'd look up and go, gosh, those are dark clouds. I mean, it, it just darkened our skies, right? Well, what if this is going on, going on all over the Earth? And what if we're being bombarded by asteroids at the same time? When an asteroid hits the Earth, it's like numerous nuclear explosions. It blows dust and debris way up in the atmosphere. And so you can see, if this were the case, how the sun would look like it's not burning. And if you got a glimpse through this mess, maybe the moon would look blood red. Again, speculation, but it kind of answers that. This verse... The moon turns to blood, sun only goes light, stars fall to the earth from heaven is a marker verse. It's found 23 times in scripture. In every case, without exception, twice in the book of Joel, second and third chapters, without exception, every case is announcing the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is always Christ's second coming to gather his elect and pour out judgment on mankind in that order. We're not appointed under wrath. Every single instant. So I call it a marker verse. So if, if, the cosmic disturbances are announcing the day of the Lord. What should we expect to see next? Well, Jesus says, shout of an archangel, sound of a trumpet. Like lightning from east to west, he says, no eye will miss it. He sends his angel to four corners of the earth to gather together as elect. What does that sound like? Sound like the rapture to me, right? So we go on seals one through four, the abomination of desolation right in the middle. Seals five, which is the great tribulation, the sixth seal, the cosmic disturbance, which cut it off. Now the rapture. The scroll's not open. The scroll's where the judgment of God exists. So we should be able to go to look in the book of Revelation between the sixth and the seventh seal and see if there's any evidence of this rapture taking place. What do we find? John goes, holy cow, what the heck? Where did all these people come from? He said it was an innumerable crowd that no man could number. Jesus, see, the dead in Christ rise first at the rapture. That'd be Genesis to present. That would be billions of people, potentially. <clears throat> And then we rise the medium and area. Could be a few more billion people, literally, again. And so there it is, the rapture, exactly where it should be. The rapture, exactly where you find it, Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Revelation, is always in this order. What I just gave you is exactly what it is. This mirrors what Marvin Rosenthal determined through in his pre-wrath rapture book, which Robert Van Campen and Joel Richardson, Alan Kushner, Travis Snow, and dozens of other men are all coming to the conclusion this is the proper order because you don't have to move anything around. It's exactly what Jesus said. It's as simple as it gets. So it's fascinating to me that Jesus went through all these seals. Now, if they'd ask him, say, when are you going to judge the nation? He'd gone through the seven. You see, after you see this innumerable crowd that no man can number, there's silence in heaven for 30 minutes. 
because everybody's going, oh my gosh. Remember John was crying because no man was worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. Well, Jesus, the line of the tribe of Judah, all authority both in heaven and earth have been given to him. So he's got the authority and he's breaking these seals. And as he's breaking these seals, there are corresponding events taking place on planet earth. That's the whole point of the infantry here. And so he gets to the sixth seal, the rapture takes place. <laughs> and then there's silence in heaven because after that, he sends his angels to start pouring out trumpet and bold judgments upon the earth. So that's a, that's a fire hose snapshot. 66 books of the Bible, 40 authors, three continents, three languages over 1800 years. And every single book of the Bible talks about this and is always in the same order. Don't wow. tell me it's not, it's not, it's by accident. It can't be by accident.